will be in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn together with me and follow along at 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, and we'll read verses 18 through 25. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, where Peter writes, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We've been looking at the life of a a true and a genuine believer in Christ and and what that looks like and how that life takes cues after, after Jesus. We're at an interesting place in this portion of scripture in Peter's account of not only the life and the death of Jesus, but its implications for the New Testament believer. And we're going to have a chance to see that. This is a, a difficult and a challenging portion of scripture for a lot of people, especially when they begin to discover that the Bible has things to say about slavery, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, granted, living in the West, and in our case, in America, we are uniquely related to a distinct form of slavery that riddles this country's past and history, the transatlantic slave trade and the Middle Passage and so forth, otherwise also known as chattel slavery, which is unique and different from the different forms of slavery that we find both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Be that as it may, we need to come to grips with the fact that slavery has existed throughout virtually all of human civilization since Genesis 3. It's just one of the products, not of creation, but of the fall. It's one of the institutions that has outlived century after century that mankind has has had to deal with in one form or another and manage with. In fact, if there's anything that's a shocker and if there's anything that's a surprise and a boon to us as a civilization... It's the lengths that we have gone, relatively speaking, in light of all of human civilization, to do away with slavery. Because for the average human being, up to relatively recently, slavery was commonplace. It was commonplace. It was unthinkable to just altogether abolish it, as we use the term. Right? 1833 in Britain led to the abolition of slavery. And then, of course, in 1865 and following, here in the States, we followed suit afterwards. But that was a novelty. And that was something that was unknown and was a shock to the world of their day. Here in the New Testament, it's not to say just to, even though we qualify the kind of slavery that the apostles had to encounter and experience and that much of the New Testament church had to deal with was distinct. It's not to say that it wasn't difficult. It was, but there's, there was no one size fits all. And so you hear you have language that has to do with servants. I know in most of our New Testament translations, we use the term servant, but in the Greek, 
if you look behind the word servant, it's basically doulos, which is another way of translating slave, right? Slave. There's no other way around it. And Peter is wanting to take a theme that he introduced in verse 16 and have it tease itself out. In the first context that he wants to tease out verse 16 is within the sphere or the domain of the workplace, if you will. Once he's making application in the sphere of the workplace, he moves on in chapter 3 and verse 1 to wives in relationship to their husbands. From there, he moves on in verse 7 to husbands in relationship to their wives. In other words, he wants us to make application in each of these areas of life to show us that the gospel has relevance in every area or sphere of life that you may find yourself in. And so here we are. In verse 16, he says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as what? Servants of God. As a Christian, my fundamental purpose in life is not to get what I want out of life, but to serve the purposes of God. In some cases, that may come with, with good to me, but other, other times, it may also come with challenges and difficulties. And Peter is dealing with a very complicated situation. I could imagine as an apostle and as an, a pastor who loves these people, he's wanting to know, now that they're saved, here you are, these people who are in different stations of life, Right? And now they come to faith in Christ, and the temptation was, and we see this in 1 Corinthians 7, that a slave thinks, because I'm free in Jesus, because my soul is free, my spirit is free, and I'm, I have forgiveness of sins, that must mean that I'm free from my master, and I can just run off, I can do whatever I wish to do. And he says, no, 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 not necessarily. And then the masters become Christians as well at different times. And they think that they can just go on using their freedom in Christ, as we saw last week, as a cover-up, verse 16, for evil. And he says, not too quickly. You're supposed to use your freedom in Christ in order to live as servants of God, not as a cover-up for evil. And so before Peter, or without Peter, in any way, doing anything toward abolishing the situation that they find themselves in, he shows them how to bring their identity in Christ to their context. I know this is a little challenging for us to make sense out of because we live in a day and age where we have unions, we have lobbies, we have different ways in which we can leverage our rights at workplaces and so forth. And it's customary for us if we see things as teachers not going the way we would like or as employees or factory workers, we call them going out on a strike in order to raise a voice. And Peter is not necessarily, or God inspiring Peter, is not necessarily saying, what, is there any sort of legitimacy in any sort of these ways in which is common to us to voice our grievances? What he is saying is this, as Christians... Our primary plan A is not to necessarily voice our grievances. It's to make sure that whatever context I find myself in, I want to make sure, how do I honor and please the Lord in this situation? The reason why this is so important is because as believers, we understand that this world isn't all it. And we also believe that we serve a God who's just. And that justice delayed does not necessarily mean justice denied. From a worldly standpoint, from a non-Christian position, I understand this is it. And if I don't see coming what I want to see coming, then I recognize that there's never going to be any other time where I'm going to. And therefore, it makes sense, doesn't it? Why, you're going to want to do everything that you can, tooth and claw, to be able to have your way. But this is where the Christian is distinguished from the rest of the world. You remember Jesus, he said, look, the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as what? A ransom for many. He says, no man takes my life. 
I know it, it may appear that way. It may appear like I'm the victim and they're the perpetrator. No man takes my life. I lay it down of my own accord. Wow. At the moment that Jesus, in the season that Jesus looked most vulnerable and most at the beck and the call of mankind, he was most in control. Because his freedom was here. He didn't need to see it in his circumstances. My freedom is not, does not belong into the hands of any employer who has to sit and decide how much he's going to pay me or she's going to pay me or when they're ever going to decide to give me a promotion or whether or not I'm going to even have an, a shot at the position or all or whether or not they're going to treat me the same way that it seems and it appears they're treating other people at the same workplace. I don't need to sit around and wait for the world to come around and recognize me for who I am. Why? Because I'm a chosen race. I know who I am. Remember, precious and chosen in his sight. You see, as Christians, the, the realest, the truest freedom for us has already taken place the moment we came to faith in Christ. Everything else is just an outworking. Sometimes it takes place here and now and immediately and right along with my conversion to Christ. Other times it delays. Other times it has to wait until we see the Lord and experience and witness our vindication. But in any case, we know what our role is. I think this is important in our day and age because there's no better time for the church to shine than at a time when people want to resort to any sort of means to have their way. You see, Peter points out in verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the what? To the unjust. So what Peter is trying to point out here, what he's saying essentially is, it's very tempting to sit around or to wait around for the kind of employer that nobody minds ever working for before you start just working like you should. And Peter's saying, as a Christian, my identity should come into that setting. My, my identity should voice a say. And when I allow my identity in Christ to weigh in on this situation, guess what? I don't have to wait for the person to be the kind of person that I need. It doesn't matter whether they're what? Gentle or whether they're unjust. Peter is not saying that you and I don't see what we see. What he's saying is you should know more that God sees. And God is tallying and he's accounting every deed by every employer, every master, no matter who they are, and that there's going to be a day of reckoning. You see, the moment I realize that nobody gets away <laughs> with anything is the moment I am free to be who God is calling me to be in any situation. But the moment, I don't care if it's just a batting thought, begins to enter into my mind, I got a strange sense that this person is going to get away with this. Guess what happens? I can't any longer live out of my identity because all of my energy, all of my emotions are going into, I got to get it back. Tit for tat. You remember what Paul says in Romans 12, which is worth noting. In Romans 12, the apostle Paul brings up something significant about this same situation. In Romans 12, beginning in verse 17, he says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of of God, but you got to have a category for the wrath of God to be able to even leave it to him, you see? So that's why I understand if I don't know Christ, if I don't understand what the gospel informs me about, then obviously wrath is going to be in my hands because there is no God in my book. 
There is no day of vengeance. There is no day of accounting. I've got to be the one who brings the gavel down on people. And Paul says, Christian, you know better. You know better. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Not your friend, your enemy. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. (laughs) That's tough. That's tough. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the gospel, friends. Romans 5.8 says, But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, enemies, Christ Jesus rec- died for us and reconciled us to himself. Not while we were friends, while we were his enemies. And so if I claim to come to faith in Christ and say that I'm a believer and I belong to Jesus, it's not enough for me to be a beneficiary of what God is doing for me in Christ. I've also got to be a channel of it as well. I've got to be someone who turns around and shows that same sort of heart attitude toward others. Yes, and even when they don't even deserve it. Even when they don't deserve it. Not because you and I didn't see what we saw, but because we realize, you know what? There, but for the grace of God, go I. I'm just like them. And yet God, in his kindness, showed me mercy. I deserved mercy far more than I think of giving them right now. And God didn't deliver any of it my way. He allowed it all to fall on his son. And he gave me grace in his place. So how can I turn around and choke somebody else after just singing his praises a moment ago? You remember the parable in the gospels of the servant who was forgiven much? You remember that situation? The person finds out about it and he leaves and he has another debt and he turns around and he holds someone accountable. Here he is, failing to realize a debt that was just canceled on his behalf by the way in which he was prepared to treat another person. You see, one of the ways in which we show where our hope truly lies and whether or not freedom is our experience, is how we're able to relate to others. And Peter is showing that. In fact, he calls it, get this, gracious. It's a gracious thing. Verse 19, 1 Peter 2, 19. For this is a gracious thing when, what's a gracious thing, Peter? When, mindful of God. So you're doing this on purpose. You're in control. You're not a victim You're not at the hands of another person. It doesn't matter what title belongs to them, what status, whether they dress well, they got a nice corner office with a lot of windows. It doesn't matter what position in the world they occupy. You know who you are. Mindful of God. This is a gracious thing. You're not doing it, but you you weren't kind toward them by accident. You went in this eyes wide open. In other words, you're bathing yourself in the gospel. You're renewing yourself in your identity in Christ. And you're recognizing, wait a second, Someone who's mindful of God who says, ooh, that was painful. I saw the way that they were prejudiced toward me. I see how they got this, but I got that. I see how they're treated one way, but I see how I'm treated another way. Part of me says, do this, but then I want to be mindful of God. In other words, I'm a Christian. There's got to be a Christian way to handle this. I'm a child of God. There's got to be a way in which somebody who is in relationship to Jesus enters into this situation. I'm mindful of God. I'm not going to follow the flesh. I'm going to follow God. I'm not going to resort to my baser self. I'm going to resort to my true self. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. That's someone who's mindful of God. Old things have passed away. Oh, old Neb would have given it to him. But I'm new. I'm new. And therefore, I want to operate out of my newness of life. I don't want to operate out of my old self. I'm mindful of God. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows 
while suffering unjustly. Bible knows how to call it. It's unjust. One endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? I mean, if, you, if you're still in office supplies and your boss catches you or the camera catches you and you get called in and they talk to you, you don't walk out of there and go Facebook Live and complain about how you're suffering for Jesus at the workplace. You stole, right? That's theft. That's not suffering for Jesus, okay? That's wrong. You had every right, and they had every reason to call you in to the office to have a word with you, if not fire you, right? And so Peter is saying, look, make sure. That's why he said in verse 16, don't use your freedom in Jesus as a cover-up for evil, right? It's like, that's not persecution, right? That's hypocrisy. And Peter says, let's make sure. That's what I want to believe right now. Let's make sure, Christians, I'm tired of hearing, reading one more article that's making headlines of pastor, or Christian this and that. It's like, I want to hear of a story that actually communicates is you're living right and they can't stand it and they give you challenges. But almost every time, I'm afraid to say it. I read the article, it's, it's true. <laughs> it's true. You deserve it. And we were a poor witness and the gospel was harmed. The church's witness was blunted and God's name was reproached. It's true. That's not good, friends. I want to hear stories. I want to come across articles that talk about another Christian, but it was, we can't see anything wrong with what he did or she did. They were simply loving God and loving neighbor. They were simply doing what they believe God called them, and yet they receive this in its place. That's a gracious thing. That's a gracious thing, Peter says. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in whose sight? It doesn't matter if nobody else recognizes it. In the sight of who? In the sight of God. You see, somebody whose identity is where it belongs is not looking for people's approval. I'm not looking to see this thing go viral. I'm not looking for somebody to give me a clap. As long as he sees it, that's enough. As long as I do it with a view toward him, that's all that matters. Because it's true. A lot of times, there's a lot of things that you and I will do because we know and you know it's the right thing to do. But when you compare the amount of praise and approval and affirmation to what you did, it doesn't line up. But you know what? You still did the right thing. And you know who's pleased with you? The one in whose sight you did it. In the sight of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Colossians beautifully captures this. In Colossians 3.23, I believe it is. He says there, he says, whatever you do, he says, bond servants, slaves, verse 22, Colossians 3.22, Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service. It's like, oh, here comes the bus. Here comes the bus. Hurry up, start working. Get busy. Get busy. Start typing. Type anything. Just, just hit the keys, right? Just whatever you do, right? No, no, no. You see, as Christians, we don't need to wait around for the auditors to come through to, to start doing things right and cleaning up our books. We don't need to wait for the, is the boss in this t today or is he at working from home? It doesn't matter. Why? I got one boss. They could be there or not. These are the, this, is, this is the kind of Christian that needs to populate our society, y'all. This, this, this is the kind of Christian that every workplace should be able to benefit from, is to know, I know those believers. They don't even have to wait for me to come around. They fear their God. And he says here, verse 22, whatever you do, he says, not by way of eye service as people pleasers. That's not your motivation. That's not what explains you at the end of the day. But with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. 
I don't fear another man or woman. I fear the Lord. This fear is, is not, I'm, I'm, I fear hell. It's, I'm saved. How can I stoop to things that put my Lord on the cross? That kind of fear. How could I busy myself with the kind of way of life that first put Jesus on the cross? Why would I go back to the things that he died for? That's what we mean by fearing the Lord, is I fear displeasing him. I fear living in such a way that my life doesn't measure up with my profession. And he says, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily, it says there. Work heartily as for your boss, because of what they said, they may be able to pay you come Christmas. No. Because of the praises that you're getting and the, no, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. You know what the implication is? We work for men. We work for people. Let's face it. Let's be honest. We do. You, you're toward me one way. All of a sudden, I feel motivated, right? I got all the energy to work. You look at me sideways and you start doing all sorts of things. All of a sudden, passive aggression, right? We show up to work late. We clock in in a very certain way. We, we half it, right? That's our way of getting back, right? We work for men. Look at our performance. It goes up and down. And look at why it goes up and down. Because of what sort of attitude, treatment we perceive we're getting. But that's not operating as one mindful of God. Right? That's being mindful of me, myself. And my desire to want to look out for me. I don't like the way you thought. I don't like the way you spoke to me. But a Christian, whatever they do, they work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Why? Next verse. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer, yeah. The Bible knows how to call it. The Bible is not in any way in challenging us, calling us to also lie. No, let's call it what it is. It was wrong of them. It was unjust. It was uncalled for. However, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. The Bible could have added with God. It's assuming you know where the partiality in relationship. So literally what it's saying is there's no partiality with God. That's what he's saying. And therefore, if there's no partiality with God, then there should be no partiality among his image bearers. This is why the Bible doesn't use the word racism. It doesn't have that word, but at the end of the day, racism would just be sinful ethnic prejudice, right? Or partiality. But there's a lot of ways we can show, we can be prejudicial toward other people. It could be on the basis of color, ethnicity, gender, all sorts of ways, right? And here... He's saying, look, when you look at the heart of God, there's no partiality with him. He's no respecter of persons, in other words. And therefore, if I claim to be an image bearer of God, then part of what it means to be an image bearer of God is to mirror him. What do mirrors do? They reflect. I'm supposed to reflect the character of God. And part of that character is no partiality. And so when I begin to resort to partiality, I'm getting away from what God is like. And now God has got to get involved. He doesn't like that. Especially when his other image bearers have to suffer at the hands of someone who's not repping God right. And he says, look, he's not. But notice, vengeance belongs to God. Vengeance belongs to God. You see, this is what Peter is saying here. He says, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God because your eyes are open. You get it. You, you can see sin for what it is. You can call it by its name, but at the same time, you're not gonna live 
bound to sin. How? Because you're free. Verse 16. Verse 16. Live as people who are free. That's you and your partiality and your business. I'm not going to allow that to influence me. I'm going to still function and operate in this world the way I know God has called me to. But a lot of times we, our whole life and relationship with others is reactionary, right? You come at me sideways, I come at you sideways. You come at me prejudicial, I'm going to come at you pre prejudicial. But that's not a Christian. I can see what's going on in the world, and I can see how people are interacting. After all, my Bible tells on you. But at the end of the day, where I take my cues from is my relationship with Christ. And I also recognize all you're doing is storing up wrath for yourself to borrow Thessalonians for the day of wrath, unless you repent and turn from your ways. So if I think whatever I can do to them is far better or far greater than what they got waiting for them by God, I'm fooling myself. God says, leave it to me. Leave it to me. You know why this is so important? Verse 21. For to this you've been called. A lot of us are wondering, like, what's my calling? What have, been, what have I been called to? What's the calling of a Christian? What are Christians called to? Well, here's a calling right here. For to this you have been called. You ready? Verse 21. Because Christ also suffered for you. The implication is it's not included unjustly. All right, he suffered unjustly. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. So Jesus, 2,000 years ago, came, entered into human history, took upon flesh, lived the life, and suffered for you and for me, leaving us an example. Those of us who would come years later, decades later, centuries later, and would learn of Christ, learn of who he is, learn of his ways, what we would discover is, Whatever it is we're learning about this Jesus, one thing is for sure we recognize. This Jesus, he suffered. And part of the motivation or the reason for his suffering was to leave us an example, those of us who would come after him and learn of him. That we might what? What are examples for? To be followed. So that we might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, the Bible says. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued huh, entrusting himself, his situation, his unjust situation, like we've been reading. He continued entrusting himself to him, speaking of the Father who judges justly. See that? There's no partiality with God. He sees it wherever it exists. He accounts for it. And then eventually, he deals with it. Jesus, as a son of God, in relationship to the Father, knew that. So not only does Peter tell us what he told us, now he says, case and point, exhibit A, Jesus. He lived this very life, I just told you, which was a gracious thing in the sight of God because he was always mindful of his Father. He was always mindful of his Father. He didn't live in reaction to other people. He knew who he was. He received his, his affirmation, his identity, and his sonship from his father. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. And the Bible tells us basically that this is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of the gospel. That Jesus came and the Bible tells us that he's sinless. He committed no sin. So whatever we learn about Jesus from here is that he's God and that he's man. Fully God and fully man. He came into this world. And even though he was God, he still had to be subject to the same suffering that you and I have had to suffer. How many religions will tell you of their God who knows the sort of things that you're passing through? None. The Christian God reminds you, friends, church, that the God that you and I worship, the God that you and I pray to, the God that you and I sing of, and make known is a God who gets our struggle. He's a God who's entered into time and history and space in order to live and identify with you and with me and our sufferings especially. Not only did he commit no sin, he didn't revile when he was reviled. 
when he was bullied, when he was slandered, when he experienced defamation of character, when he was wrongly accused, when he was falsely accused, when he was unnecessarily criticized, he didn't return in kind. But rather, he entrusted his whole situation into the hands of the one who judges justly. You see, if Jesus responded the way our flesh is tempted to want to respond, you and I would not be Christians today. You and I would still be dead in our sins. The reason why we love Jesus and we treasure Christ and we look to him and we adore him is because it was this life, sinless life, who committed no sin, this life that God found acceptable. The only way that God was able to totally and finally and completely deal with our sins and bring peace between us and him and usher us eventually into his presence is because Jesus said, look, I can't just respond from the hip. I can't just be any old way like I see being done to me. If I am, I'll have none. I'll have none with me. That's why in John 12, 24, it says, unless the grain of wheat, truly, truly, I say to you, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, speaking of his death and resurrection, it abides, huh, alone. You ever seen an acorn above the ground? That's all it is. You'll never see an oak tree out of it. The only way you're going to see an oak tree is if it's prepared to say goodbye to its previous self. And Jesus said, you know what? As much as I love how things are, I'm prepared to give it all up and away in order for what I will gain on the other end. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. It bears much fruit. No one who saves, anyone who saves their life, next verse, anyone who seeks to save their life in the end loses it. But the one who loses his life for my sake, not for the employers, not for somebody who's cruel and unjust, but the one who loses his life for my sake and for the gospel in the end, huh, finds it. You see, guess who wins in the end? The Christian. The Christian. You see, Jesus not only went forward himself with this life, he calls us to go forward following in his footsteps. You see, your suffering and my suffering could never pay for my sins or your sins. That's the one downer, right? There's no amount of suffering. I wish I could, but there's no amount of suffering that I could ever undergo that would result in your sins being forgiven. But in Jesus's case, what makes his suffering, which was done in our place for our sins, unique, and therefore we can't follow that example. That's the one way in which Jesus suffered that we can't follow after is the fact that he was our substitute. He died in our place and for our sins. He was able to bear in his body on the tree our sins once and for all in such a fashion that we can die to sin and live to righteousness because he's both God and man. As God, he was able to actually pay for those sins and endure what would have been an equivalent to an eternity in hell. As man, his death his sacrifice was able to be applied to us because he's identifying with us as human beings. So then, in what way does Jesus' suffering then, if it doesn't apply there, apply to us as an example for us to follow? The moment I decide to sign up to follow Jesus, it's no longer about what I'm trying to get out of life and out of the world, and out of others. It's what God is trying to get out of my life. You see, when Jesus was pressured to go up to a particular feast and be about being popular and making his name known, he told his brothers, look, your time is always. I do what the Father tells me to do. I go where the Father tells me to go. I say what the Father tells me to say. You see, Jesus knew that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's gonna be revealed to us. Yeah, suffering is painful, friends. 
and no one likes being mistreated. Come on. And we all know the pain and the hurt and the harm that exists when people have to be taken advantage of, whether it's on a small level or on a great level. But I need you to know something. If that's you, or if that's someone you know, there's hope. Number one, because there's a God who you and I can pray to who suffered. First thing I can know, that when I'm praying, I need, I need to know that he gets me. I mean, how many of you, when you're struggling, you don't just tell your laundry, your dirt, your stuff, your private things to just anybody. You're very careful, aren't you? What are you thinking about? You're evaluating the person that you imagine you would like to share something so private with. What do you evaluate? You're trying to see, is this the kind of person that will know how to handle my information? Is this the kind of person that can hold something like this in confidence? Is this the kind of person that won't change in their view of me once they learn about this? Is this the kind of person who has both feet on the ground? Or are they just going to look at me like I'm from another planet? Right? You're trying to find out if the person that you're going to share with can identify with you on some level. And what does that do? That motivates you to come out. <laughs> I'm here to tell you right now, God is the only person that can identify with us through and through. The Bible says we have a high priest who is not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every way tested like we are, yet without sin. That's Jesus. He was, he was tempted and tested in every way through his sufferings. What he's saying is he can sympathize. You can draw near to him and know that he gets you, but even more than gets you. You can know, however painful your suffering is, know that the suffering that he underwent spared you more than any amount of suffering you can ever undergo on this earth. Because the suffering you're undergoing at the workplace pales in comparison to the suffering that you and I would endure in an eternity in hell separated from God. And Jesus addressed your greatest suffering. It doesn't eliminate my suffering, but it sure does put it into perspective, doesn't it? Because now when I realize I could have had an eternity in hell separated from this God as a result of my sins. But Jesus came and he bridged the gap between me and this God that my sins could have never had anything to do with. And now I look back upon the things I've got to deal with in my life that are unjust, that need dealing I can handle it now because I can focus on praise God. My sins are forgiven. Praise God, I'm free. I'm new in Christ. This man, this woman can't define me. That job can't tell the whole story about me. This season of my life can't tell the whole film. It's just, it's just a segment in the program. <laughs> There's still 12 more episodes to go in the same season, not to mention the seasons that follow. But when we lose sight of the gospel and the sufferings that Jesus had to undergo, we look at our chapter in our story as though it's the whole book. We look at the moment in our next Netflix film as though it's the whole movie. We look at the season of our life as if it represents all seasons when it doesn't because it doesn't doesn't. This is just a chapter, church, that you're passing through. God wins. And if you belong to him, you win. You win. I want to close at this point. Because I believe there's real freedom in this message. Many of you are probably, maybe all of you, are familiar with the parable in Luke chapter 18. Powerful parable 
of an injustice. This is going to be a good way to close. In that parable is a widow. And this widow has had an injustice done to her. You got to understand the ancient world, especially during Jesus' day. It wasn't easy. Add on top of that a woman, not only a woman, she's a widow, so there's no man, no husband to stand in her defense, to, to be a protector or a provider or to preside. She's alone. And so she doesn't have the social fabric to be able to back her. I don't know if we can imagine a greater victim than the role that she's playing in this parable. And Jesus, the Bible tells us in Luke 18, that in order to teach them about prayer, the disciples about prayer, he tells them this parable. And he tells us that there was this widow who had approached this judge. It wasn't one time, two times, three times, many times. She kept coming back, county hall, city hall. Here she is. She gets on the BART. She makes it there again, hoping for a change, hoping for a difference, at least this time, maybe today, knocking on those doors. But the problem is we learn a thing or two about this judge. What we're told about the judge are two things. He's the kind of judge who neither fears God nor regards other people, human beings. Great. And this is the kind of person that occupies a position of privilege, authority, and power. He, has some, he can do something about her situation, in other words. That he's all she's got. And so she comes to him again and again, to no avail. And you would think at this point, I mean, you should get the clue, right? You should start looking for other options. But she doesn't. And we start learning about the way in which this judge is frustrated and uh, just bothered, literally, by this woman. So much so that on one occasion when she decides to come again, yes, again, he says, look, okay, I've got to do something about her, lest through her beating me with her requests for justice, she weary me. And so he gives her what she wants. Jesus flips the script. He turns the whole parable on its head. He says, you see that? <laughs> this is a judge who neither fears God nor regards people. And look what he did for her. Shall not God's elect, therefore, who cry to him day and night be heard? Jesus says, I tell you, they will speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? See, what Jesus is saying here is he's trying to point out and emphasize how much our Father is not like the judge. There are a lot of parables who try to, that try to draw comparisons. God's like that. In this parable, what the point is, God's not like that. You see, this woman had every reason to give up long time ago with this judge. I mean, there was no motivation found in him that explains why she kept coming. Whatever it is that explains it, it's not with him. You're wasting your time if you, if you think so. And yet she persisted in her coming to him. You and I can find all of our motivation in God, you see. You and I don't have to try to reach and grab and grope for some desperate motivation to overlook what's in front of us. No, God's enough. Because we know that God's for us. We know that God's prepared to serve our interests. God's prepared to come through for us. The Bible says, he who did not spare his own son. He who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He will. If he did that, what makes you think he won't do this? Is what Paul is saying. Right? The hardest thing that should, that should blow our minds away is that he gave up his son to die in our place. If, if there's no confusion about that, 
how can I be confused about all of the other ways I need God to show up in my life? Because whatever it is, it pales in comparison to what he already did in my place for my sins. See, you and I already have something to go off of with our God. He doesn't need to begin being good in our lives. He already is good. He doesn't need to begin being merciful and faithful and begin to be all that he is. He already is. You and I just need to be reminded of who our Father is. You and I just need to be reminded all over again that our God is good and that he is greatly to be praised and that he wants us to pursue him in this sort of way. We're that widow. And I would like to invite us right now as we close at this point to not go before a judge like she did, but to go before a father who loved us enough to give us his son. Amen? Let's bring all of our trouble, all of our injustices, let's bring all of our pain, anything where we feel like the world is not right for this. God hears, God sees, God knows. Father, we come before you right now. Thank you. Thank you that it's for freedom that you have set us free. Lord, I pray right now, I know the pain can go deep. I know how easy it is to hold on to grudges and resentment and bitterness. But right now, we ask for a supernatural grace that you would help us to release people from our lives, release experiences, release run-ins, release any sort of situation that we may have found ourselves. We're not called to be bound to our past or even bound to a situation. Nobody in this world, no matter who they are, has that much control or that much authority over our lives. We're free. We're free in Christ today. And I pray, Lord God, that when you look upon our lives, that you would help us. Whatever we do, may we work heartily as for you and not for other people, knowing that it's from the Lord that we expect our reward. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sufferings in our place. Thank you for his death. We no longer need to live to sin. We can live to righteousness. Remind us all over again of our identity in Jesus. Help us now, early, to begin to experience true freedom from others, from their words, from their actions, from their misdeeds. Lord, I pray. God, you can do this, and we thank you for it, and we celebrate your grace in our lives. And we pray that as we close here and now, and we go our respective ways, I pray for you to accompany each and every person. Help them, Lord, along the way. Walk with them. Encourage their hearts. Strengthen them where it counts. In Jesus' name we pray.